Bless the Lord, everybody. <laughs> everybody, bless the Lord. Good to be here with you one more time to share the gospel of Christ. We believe God has called us to the kingdom for a time like this. Hello. And that's what we're here for. We're here for the word. Eh? And I believe the word is doing wonders in us more than we can take our natural eyes and see, more than our flesh can feel. Why? Because it's the word of God. And the word of God is always bringing into being what the word says. It has creative power. Praise God. And so we encourage you to be strong in the word. <laughs> That's in the Lord. Eh? <laughs> and in the power of his might. Praise God. Hallelujah. Father, we thank you for another occasion to be here tonight to get into your word we believe you are depositing of yourself of your virtue of your spirit of your power to us through your word and your holy spirit is here as our helper to ensure that the word take its full effect as we lean not to our own understanding we depend and, and trust in the leadership of your holy spirit in unveiling the power the mysteries of your word, O oh God, word of your power, the word of your kingdom in our spirit, man, that we will walk in understanding and bear fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains. We pray against every distortion, distraction, illusion, delusion, confusion, everything the enemy has sown to pervert, corrupt, or derail us from understanding your word. We come against it now in the name of Jesus. We plead your blood over your people and over the audience as they hear your word tonight that you grant them grace to understand. And indeed, it will bear fruit, much fruit and fruit that remains in their life as we give you all the praise and all the glory in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. Come on, give him the praise. Hallelujah. Thank you all for coming. You may be seated. We're going to get right into the word. Hello, somebody. And the word is the word of the kingdom. Hallelujah. And Jesus says when one hears the word of the kingdom and does not understand it, the enemy will come and rob the word from us. When we understand the word, hallelujah, then of course he says we bear fruit and much fruit. Amen. And he says from 60 to 30, 60 and 100 fold. And that is the, the result of us abiding in the word of God. Amen. So tell those who are watching online around you to gather around and get into the word. Hallelujah. Draw for their Bible, notebook, and pen and get into the word. Amen. Praise God. All right. <laughs> Bless the Lord. All right. We are starting with the word Paul gave to Timothy in 1 Timothy 1. And we want to base on no other doctrine. What we are basing it on, no other doctrine. Hallelujah. That was something that Paul wanted to be engraved in the spirit of Timothy. That after he's no longer here in physical form with him, he will not swerve to the left nor to the right and try to find some new age teaching to sound like he's one of the new age boys. <laughs> Yeah, because Paul is dating in every place that he writes, his writing is declaring that there's one gospel he's received. Amen. And that's the one gospel we have to declare, and that's the gospel of the kingdom. Come on. So in, in um, 1 Timothy 1, we'll read from, hallelujah. Let's read it from verse 1. He says, Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ, by the commandment of God our Savior, and Lord and the Lord Jesus Christ, our hope to Timothy, a true son in the faith, grace, mercy, and peace from God our Father and Jesus Christ our Lord. As I urge you when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus that you may what? Charge some that they teach no other doctrine that they what teach no other doctrine nor give heed to fables and endless genealogies which cause disputes 
rather than godly edification which is in faith now the purpose of the commandment is love from a pure heart from a good conscience and from sincere faith from which some have been strayed have turned aside to what idle talk desiring to be teachers of the law understanding neither what they say nor the things which they affirm uh, but they well want to teach him and the man they're going at it he said but we know that the law is good is there a condition yes ever we see the word in the statement if is showing a term by which it is required to show what was said earlier is right he said we know that the law is good if one uses it lawfully that's the condition he says knowing this knowing this what that the law is not for a righteous person come on now but for the lawless and insubordinate for the ungodly and for sinners for the unholy and profane for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers for manslayers for fornicators for sodomites for kidnappers for liars for perjurers and if there is any other thing that is what contrary to sound doctrine he says according to the glorious gospel huh of the blessed god which was committed to my trust in other words paul says it's the gospel that teaches him that that's the purpose of the law and he says i thank christ jesus our lord who has enabled me because he counted me faithful putting me into the ministry although i was formerly i was formerly what a blasphemer persecutor and an insolent man <laughs> but i obtained what mercy because i did it ignorantly in unbelief come on he's not saying that's the person he is now but he's saying that was the person he was then being in unbelief and he said the grace of our lord was exceedingly abundant with faith and love which are in christ jesus this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptance that christ jesus came into the world to save who sinners of whom i am chief now, that is one that i heard a preacher said you know that means paul is saying he's the chief of sinners and yet still the lord save him that's not a true rendition of what paul said at all paul is referring of himself being a sinner in past tense though he says i am he's saying in present tense of saying i am to say amongst all those who sin he would consider himself doing the worst among them why because he said he was a blasphemer he was one who caused people to turn from the faith he was being used to injure the church and was seeking very much to destroy it and he says that is a deadly thing come on now and so he says man i was chief among them of that but that's not saying he's chief among sinners no <laughs> no because no one who's a sinner really is saved he says jesus came into the world to save sinners and how does he save sinners by the remaining sinners no because he came to save them from their sins and if they are saved from their sins they can't still be practicing in sin and say i'm saved from it you got it yeah we have to make that clarification for some uh, strange doctrines out there yeah which paul told timothy there's no other doctrine huh come on now huh he says however for this reason what reason i obtain mercy that in me huh first jesus christ might show what all long suffering as a pattern to who to those are going to believe on him for what everlasting life now to the king eternal immortal invisible to god 
who alone is wise be Hannah and glory how long forever and ever amen and then Timothy, Paul says see Timothy this charge I commit to you son Timothy according to the, pro the, the prophecies previously made concerning you that by them you may what wage the good warfare come on now having faith and a good conscience which some have been rejected concerning what concerning the faith have suffered what shipwreck of whom are who Hymenius and an Alexander whom I delivered to who oh so if he Paul the chief of sinners then he must be worse than I mean yes. and Alexander so I'm delivering him to Satan you see, you see he's not, he, we, we are saved <laughs> as sinners to live as saints not to continue living as sinners say, I am a sinner yeah? those who teach us things aren't teaching the doctrine of Christ Paul said these persons have what they have heard concerning the faith. They have, they have suffered shipwreck. They have suffered. <laughs> Man, you say a person suffers shipwreck. It's great disaster, you know. Because if you ever see a shipwreck, it's not nothing good. Hello, somebody. <laughs> Just looking at a movie with some shipwreck. The young people on this cruise get themselves in some trouble out there and ship capsized. With them and they're trying to find root out of it, and it's nothing. May I tell you, it's not nice. That was no vacation at all. And <laughs> caught in that kind of mess. And Paul himself caught himself in some shipwreck. So when he says shipwreck their feet, he know. Say that's not a good scene. Come on now. He, he says concern, they have. He says, which some have, have been rejected. What have they rejected? He says, have they have, have been rejected, having faith and a good conscience. That's what he said to, to, to Timothy. Huh? That he said to Timothy that you may wage war, wage, wage the good warfare. Having what? Yes, wage the good warfare, having faith and that good conscience, he says, which some have been rejected concerning the faith, have shipwrecked, suffered shipwrecked. Come on now. In other words, the faith of my God been compromised. Huh? They have lost their faith. The, the faith, they will still say they have faith. Hymenius would say he still have faith. And Alexander would probably still disagree with Paul and said, No, we still got faith just because we don't agree with you. Now, <laughs> but Paul wasn't saying that at all. Paul's report was saying they have been delivered. He have what? He delivered them to Satan that they may learn not to blaspheme. That they may learn what? <laughs> Oh, in other words, they have some teaching that he says are pretty much blasphemous teachings. They go against what the Lord is saying and what the Lord requires of his people. Come on. All doctrines are not from the Lord. Remember what we're talking about tonight, that Paul was encouraging Timothy, that there is no other doctrine. Come on now. That there is what? That's what he said to, to Timothy. Praise God in 1 Timothy 1, verse 3. Hallelujah. Urge Timothy. He says, when I went into Macedonia, remain in Ephesus. Remain in Ephesus that you may charge some that they teach no other doctrine. That they what? They teach no other doctrine. Did, did Paul stay faithful to the doctrine? Oh, yes, he did. Come on. Look in Romans chapter 16. Romans chapter 16. We start there. Hallelujah. Romans 16 from verse 17. Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. 
Paul said there even amongst the Romans, he says, Now I urge you, brethren, note those who cause what? Divisions and offenses contrary to what? Contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid them. For those who are such do not serve our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly. Oh, that sound, you know, sound good to me. <laughs> and by smooth words and flattering speech, deceive the hearts of the simple. Come on. Smooth words and what? Flattering speech. Deceive the hearts of the people. Come on now. For your obedience, he says, has become known to all. Therefore, I am glad on your behalf. But I want you to be wise in what is good and simple concerning evil. Come on now. Huh? You understand when he says simple concerning evil? When he says wise, he says, I want you to be very equipped and knowledgeable concerning what is good. But concerning what is evil, I want you to be ignorant of it. Unlearned, untrained, and unqualified. Don't ever qualify for that one. But some people is very trained in that one. Hello. And they want to tell a lie, man, they know to craft it. Hello. You would be there booking and shuffling, but they have it a long time. They have their answer pre-prepared. Hello. But he's saying, uh-uh, you must stay in sound doctrine, eh? You must understand yourself and know you must not do anything contrary to the doctrine which you learned and avoid those who do. Come on now. That's what he said. Praise God. Also, he wrote that as we quoted it from, from Romans. And he also said it to the church in Corinth. 2 Corinthians 11. 2 Corinthians 11. I think from probably verse 4. Verse 4. Hallelujah. Yes. All right. So let's take it from. Hallelujah. Take it from verse 1 to verse, to verse 4. Praise God. You there? All right, he says to, this, to the saints at Corinth, he says, Oh, that you would bear with me a little folly. And indeed you do bear with me. For I am jealous for you. With what? Godly jealousy. Oh, come on, Paul. Remember, say, they don't really belong to you. No, they belong to the Lord. Uh, yeah, you ever heard those talk? Not you. Yeah, they go on like uh, you are in the church. I know you are the church. Jesus are the head of the church. Only one head. You ever heard that one? And so they believe you should bear no godly jealousy for who you've been laboring over to bring them and to present them to Christ. Yeah, Paul said, uh uh. I, I, Paul is expressing this in writing and said, I am jealous for you with what? Godly jealousy, for I have betrothed you to what? One husband, huh? that I may present you as a chaste virgin to him, to Christ. But I fear, lest somehow as the serpent deceived Eve by his craftiness, so your minds may be what? Corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. He said he gave it to them simple that even a child, a baby sitting there could hear and understand. But some people love the people them that quote some word. They have to grab dictionary and make a note a word and look for it later. Then they say, man, the man went deep. You know what a man profound or spacious or loving God. He says, our space what? Yeah, man, our spacious. <laughs> Yes, man. They love hear them kind of teacher. Then they say, that man teach, man. Mm. Eh? They, they, they have, he says that they have been corrupted from the simplicity 
that is in Christ. For it says, if he who comes preaches another Jesus, whom we have not preached, or if you receive a different spirit, which you have not received, or a different gospel, which you have not accepted, you may well put up with it. Come on now. Easily seduce and let us train. Come on now. And we got to understand who the Lord appoints us to hear. Huh? The, have the Lord appointed person in the body to teach the gospel to those who are in the body of Christ. Oh yes, he has. Come on. And that's why he says then, you must know who the Lord appoint to you. Now sir, that's what Paul was speaking about. Why was, why did, what did Christ give to the body? The offices, the fivefold ministry for. He says it's for the saints. It's not for the world. And he said in Ephesians 4, verse 11 to 16, praise God, he says, he himself gave some to be apostles. Some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors and teachers. And what are they given for? For the equipping of who? For the world? No, for the saints. For the work of the ministry. Huh? And for what? For the edifying of the body of Christ. What is the body of Christ? The church. And he says, till we all come. That's the church. Till we all come. To the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of what? The Son of God to a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Now he says, come to the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God. Surely he's not saying that everybody have their different view, conflicting views and opinions about it. But we all share in front of the same God. He says, no, when he says come into the unity of the faith and of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man, he's saying, to one who is in sound mind and somebody in sound mind and sound mentality is not speaking here and there and conflicting things and the mind all over the place. You would say when they're speaking like that and you cannot make sense out of what they're saying because what they're saying is contradicting themselves. You say they are on sound mind. And so he says, to a perfect man, he's saying the church must come to that place that they're all agreeing on the same truth because it's one gospel, it's one faith, one Lord, one baptism, one spirit. He says, we have all been baptized into. Now, so, so it's, that's why he told Timothy, there are those who will come to cause division. Huh? That's what he said earlier in, in uh Praise God that some would come to cause division. But it says, mark them who come to cause division and careful around them. Now, so, as we read earlier, praise God. But we want you to know that Paul is making it clear. This is their purpose. Huh? Hallelujah. To bring them in the fullness a per, to a perfect man, to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. But there we also warn about why is this need of grooming and discipling the people of God in the church so necessary. He says because others are coming that are coming with doctrines that are not so sound. Guess what I'm saying? Look what he said. That we should no longer be what? Children tossed to and fro and tired about with what? Every wind of doctrine. Surely he's saying there Every doctrine is not from the Lord. Got it? He says, there are many who will be carried and influenced and carried, tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine. But he says, we are training you, maturing you, bringing you in the unity of the faith and the knowledge of the Son of God, that this will not be your state, that you would no longer be children tossed to and fro and carried about with every wind of doctrine by the what? Trickery of men. The trickery of men, they're talking about men who are using the word, but not using the word accurately. Got it? 
His teacher still coming, but he says, uh-uh. Those who are coming with those lessons and those doctrine did not come from God. Their, their words have become corrupted by the source they are entangling with. Come on. Which is of evil. Huh? So he says, in cunning craftiness of what? He says, this wasn't some mistake and some human error they made in having this teaching. He says, this was cunning craftiness of deceitful plotting. It have to do with the nature of who they're blinging with. Which Satan himself has that nature of being cunning, crafty, as a father of lies. Come on now. Huh? So that's how Paul referred to it as saying, hey, there are persons who are teaching things that not so wholesome. And of course, it is leading and entertaining sin in the people's life and giving them this false sense of security that though they are still engaging in sin, God understands it's going to be all right. And that is not the teaching of the gospel at all. Come on now. But Paul says, hey, we speaking the truth, but what? Speaking the truth in love may grow up. This is the intent of why I say we declare the truth to you. That you may grow up in what? All things into him who is the head. Who is that? Christ, from whom the whole body, joint and knit together by what? Every joint supplies according to what? The effective working by which every part what does it you know if every part does it share it brings in what he speaks about the unity of the faith and the unity of the of the knowledge that they have of the son of god got it and that will of course produce growth that will what Yes, in both in spiritually, in maturity, and also in numbers of those who are truly being wrought, um, trained in the word of the kingdom. He says, causing growth of the body for the edifying of itself in, in love. Come on. Hallelujah. And we know that even John, hallelujah, warned that we should be careful not to believe every spirit and he said that in first john 4 verse 1 to 3 huh? in first john 4 verse 1 to 3 he said beloved huh do not believe every spirit but test the spirits and i was saying it the other day you know that when john said beloved don't believe every spirit but test the spirit he wasn't telling them the believers to test him are telling the believers don't believe him because him is one spirit too don't believe then we wouldn't have his letters as scriptures to trust what he wrote as scriptures as the word of god but he's saying don't believe every spirit he didn't say don't believe no spirit at all that would mean say not even him we must believe. But that wouldn't be it at all. He says, don't believe every spirit, but test the spirits, whether they are what? Of God, because what? He said, many false prophets. He didn't say, many prophets are out there. If it is that every prophet out there falls, he wouldn't need to say false prophet. He just said, no prophet out there. And they went confused and fooling up. But no, he says, many false prophets. That means they are coming as counterfeit, as those who are misrepresenting the kingdom of God and the word of God. Yeah? And he says, many false prophets have gone out into the world. And he says, by this, you will know the spirit of God. And I tell you, it took a while before I came to understand the in-depth meaning of this, this, this test, that, that this mode of testing that John spoke of here in verse 2 and 3 was just to say that I believe Jesus, when he came here, he came in the flesh. You know, <laughs> he came in human body. 
That was the first understanding I have of it. Jesus came in human body. But no, um, J John, when he was declaring this, know that Jesus was not here in human body anymore. So how would they test then those who have that spirit to know that they are not of God because they confess that Jesus come in human body? No, look at it. Good, we're going to show you right now. He says, by this you know that the spirit, know the spirit of God. Every spirit that what? Confesses that Jesus has come in the flesh, not in his flesh. I want you to know that. In the flesh. Hallelujah. Because they thought of the Christ being the son of God. So it's God coming down amongst humanity that's why they said it would be called Emmanuel which interpret means God with us but they never received Jesus they believed in Christ you know, but they never received Jesus as the Christ you got it because he come in human flesh and they're saying man we know this one he was born amongst us grew amongst us and all of a sudden he's talking like he come out of heaven. He talking like he, he's God manifested in human. So they, of course, many times they sought to kill him. Until he, yes, they did die on the cross. But they rise again the third day. Huh? And it says that was the testimony to them that he was truly of God. Huh? And that, then he says then, what does it mean then to confess? that Jesus has come in the flesh. Is it just for someone to say Jesus come in the flesh? Even the devil can confess that and that will make the devil of God. Come on. The devil knows that Jesus came in the flesh. He knows that Christ has come in the flesh. Because where would there be a crucifixion if there was nothing in the flesh? How would he have tasted of death if he was not in the flesh? Come on now. But the, the, the key note there to understand who is of God is to know that Christ is manifesting in their flesh. Did you hear that? I don't want it speed past you like a flying jet and you don't get it. I want you to understand it. It's, a it's not a test of the flesh. He says, test the spirits. What did he say? So, so he says, is the spirit of the person is going to be tested? Is that spirit as Christ or is it another spirit operating contrary to Christ? Come on now. That's what he calls the antichrist. That's what he call what? An antichrist is against Christ. It, in other words, whatever that person is teaching and living must be in sync with what Christ thought and, and uh, Christ lived. See, because Christ doesn't work or teach against himself. He doesn't teach against what he taught earlier because as the time moves on now, he have to upgrade the teaching to say something new to catch a new crowd. No, his teaching is consistent, line upon line, precept upon precept, here a little, there a little, but all the word come together to give the one message, word of the kingdom, of God's governance and rule over all his creation, and let him know that they must submit to God's rule, to God's way of governance over his creation, that they can become his ears and partake as with him in his kingdom. Come on now. Now that is what he always thought, but he says, some will come teaching, come cheer it to that. Uh, so he says, you should then be able to identify who is of the Lord and who is not. And the Lord said it this way, you will know them by their fruit. He didn't say you will know them by their gifts. And many have been fooled by following those who have been gifted 
Man, he told me what I ate this morning. He told me I was going abroad. He tell me when I was a little boy who went through something in my yard and me never passed the exam. Eh? And then they start to gravitate to that person. I have a son you hear. He's a prophet of the mighty man of God teaching the people. But they have not checked out the character. Jesus didn't just come displaying gifts and signs and miracles. The main thrust of his ministry was that he bear the heart of God. The character and nature of his father was being revealed through him. And he could go, it was so much so that he could say to his disciples, when you see me, you see the Father. Whoa, come on. And that, that is something that must be clear amongst those who said, I come in the name of the Lord. There must be a clear display of Christ. Each point that the, the, the persons started to withdraw from Paul, and Paul had to correct them because some false teacher or teachings came there that wanted to seduce and draw them from Paul. What did Paul make reference to about them? That he presented himself to them even as Christ. He says, Christ was fully displayed to you when I was among you. And said, you would, you would take out your eye and give me. You saw me as an angel. You saw me that the picture of Christ being displayed plainly as Christ behind a tree. Come on now. In other words, it wasn't so much about him bigging up himself. It was about him revealing Christ to them. And he says, whoever is coming to minister, no matter how gifted they are, is the glory and the, and the point of exaltation being pointed to Christ? Or is it becoming self-centered? Huh? Because it says, if it is Christ in you, then that's what we need to see coming from you. Huh? It says, how do we test them that are of God? He says, do their confession, what they declare and how they live. Does it line up with what Christ declared? Because who Christ gave as true ministers, as true apostles, as true prophets, as true evangelists, as true pastors, they were given to reveal his grace. It wasn't about them exalting and bigging up themselves. To get a crowd and to become famous and popular amongst the people. Huh? It wasn't just about joining a crowd. It was more so about making disciples. It was about what? Come on, come on, follow me here. Are you getting it? Hallelujah. It was about what? Because what was the main thrust there amongst those who he gave us? Apostles and prophets and evangelists, pastors and teachers. He said in verse 13, Till we all come to the unity of the faith. And of the knowledge of the Son of God to a perfect man. To the measure of the stature of the fullness of who? They're not Christ. They must be full of. He's not full of me. <laughs> full with Christ. Because Paul made it clear that I am crucified. Ah, in Galatians 2 verse 20. Paul made it clear that it's Christ that is on display. I have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. And the life which I now live in the flesh. I live by faith in him. In who? The son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Come on. So he said, when we start to make it Christ-centered, my God, what can Christ do? Uh, don't you remember? Come on, somebody. He's a miracle work in God. Hallelujah. And of course, miracles will birth forth, but the greatest miracle is Christ being displayed in and through you. Come on, somebody. 
greatest miracle is a life that is sold out to God's holiness, righteousness, and truth. Come on now. So now, even amongst John, that the Lord says, of those born from a woman, there's not one greater than John. John didn't do one miracle, but John, of course, lived a life that was holy and righteous and true. Come on, that they could say all that John have said about this man is true. In other words, his testimony of Christ was sure. Glory to God. And that was a good report for him. And it will still be a good report for anyone who truly trusts in the Lord. Huh? No other doctrine. Huh? Come on, somebody. Hallelujah. Paul made that same clear statement to the Galatians. In Galatians 1, verse 6 to 7. He, he, he had to rebuke them about this because they heard the gospel from him. But sooner as some Jews came amongst them and told him, hey, Jesus was a Jew. Jesus was circumcised. Jesus was keeping feast days. They start to go back to those things and think they were becoming more righteous in the eyes of the Lord. Somehow they thought Paul may have oversight in missing out those teachings to them. And now they're finding true justice and true teaching in it to really be close to God. And Paul said, this was not a spiritual move that was a carnal move to now be subjugated to the law rather than being led and empowered by grace to walk in newness of life huh and he said to them in verse 6 i marvel that you are turning away so soon from who notice he didn't say from me he said from him who called you in the grace of christ that of course include him he called them in the grace of christ but he says from him because who is the one working through him to call them it was christ you got it because we, that's why we gave the verse before he says it's not i who no longer live but christ who lives in me so he says i didn't do this of myself he says you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another in other words there is one gospel hello he said but there are some who trouble you and want to what pervert the gospel of Christ but he says but if we are an angel from heaven huh? But Paul goes so far to say, even an angel from heaven coming down with the glory of God and him and say, I got another one for you. Yeah, that's how they say, Helen G. White, get her gospel. And then they start a whole nation of teaching and that and from Seventh-day Adventists. Huh? But the angel sure a fourth commandment for, to go back to Sabbath. Paul said to these Gentiles who were no Christian, if, if even an angel from heaven preached another gospel to you than what we have preached, because Paul knows he didn't preach that to them for them to be saved. He preached Christ to them for them to be saved. And he says, to what have you... Uh, huh? to any other gospel to you than what we have preached to you he says let him be what a curse come on he said withdraw run for your life because that won't mean nothing good for you hello somebody he says that is someone you should reject he says as i as we have said before in other words he's saying this is not the first time he's saying it to them he says so now Huh? So now I say again. He said, I said it before. And now I say it again. If anyone preaches any other gospel to you than what you have received, let him be a curse. Huh? Come on, give me more there. And he said what? Hallelujah. For do I now persuade man or God? In other words, is he trying to please men in preaching the word? Is it about getting the fancy and the likes and the thumbs up and the nice comments 
and reviews online as many of them go by reviews and likes and eh? he said uh uh he says uh, what we did we see we didn't seek to please men our objective was to please god and those who want to please god will agree that's how they're gonna know who is of the lord the objective is to please god and not to please men he says for if i still pleased men i would not be a bond servant of christ in other words he would not be a faithful servant to the lord if he sought to put the priority on pleasing men rather than pleasing god hello so what he said but i made known to you brethren that the gospel which was preached by me is not according to men what did he mean not according to men did men minister the word to paul of course they did but he says hey it's not according to men's own imagination and reason and intellect it came by divine revelation through christ hello come on give me some more he says for i neither received it from man nor i was i taught it but it came through what the revelation of jesus christ for what you have heard of my former conduct in judaism this is what is called the jews religion and paul didn't say he get a new religion birth out of judaism as they call it today christianity and say christianity is birth out of judaism and so it's judaism judaism christian faith they join the two word of judaism and christian and say that's our newfound faith but he said that's not what christ gave to us the faith christ gave to us is the faith that comes through believing the word of god and he says when he was in judaism if it was about faith believing in the word of god would he be persecuting the church of god no but he was actually persecuting the church of god through that religion and that is the jews religion so if jesus came to just affirm and start a Jewish religion is, and it's out that is Jewish religion we have this faith today he said uh-uh that ain't the truth because he says uh, it's out of that religion that he persecuted the church of God and he never referred to the church of God as part of that religion he said they, they were referred to as a sect apart and separate from the religion watch this he says oh i persecuted the church of god beyond measure and tried to destroy it and what happened was he demoted for trying to persecute the church no he said actually he was promoted in the religion for doing it so how does this faith birth out of that religion how do we cause it to say we have a Judeo-Christian faith and say it is Christianity and Judaism coming together for us to have the true faith we have today? Not so. Paul testified against that in Galatians 1 and gave his personal testimony that in Judaism, that's what he did, persecuting the church of God beyond measure and tried to what? destroyed it and because he was trying to destroy it they was he demoted in his religion no he said he was promoted he says i advanced in judaism i advanced in the jews religion so how is that jews religion now being adopted by christians as part of their faith don't you realize that the very thing that caused paul to be killed because the Jews were holding on to their Jews' religion. You better understand this. That was why the Jews rejected Christ. Because they were holding on to their religion. You believe that Christ enhanced what they had there. Christ came to build something different from what they had. 
Come on, somebody. If it was the same, you wouldn't need to say, my church. It would just be the church already up in there under Judaism that is enhancing. But he says, I will build mine. And it's the first time the word church is mentioned when Jesus mentioned it. And there was no church before. His church. You need to understand this principle. Hello. When he used that word and said, on this rock I build my church. What was that rock? The revelation of who he is. As he asked the disciples, who do you say that I am? And Peter declared, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. And Jesus said to Peter, is not flesh and blood. In other words, man didn't reveal this to you. Who revealed it to you? But my father who is in heaven. Come on, the same way Paul is saying the gospel that he preached was not given to him by men. He says, Christ revealed it to me. You got it. So he says, then this is a more sure word than word through men who have been tainted by sin. He says, this one is coming through the Son of God himself. Huh? They would say in regular terminology from the horse's mouth. They not always say, we get it live and direct from the source. Why? Because it says, God is revealing Christ to this man directly that it don't be perverted by what he learned through his religion. But because he says, through his religion, he was persecuting and trying even to destroy the church. And the church of God there is mentioned as the household of faith or another term for household of faith is God's family and that's the people that's why the word church is used rather than the synagogues and and this and the temples huh? and the sanctuaries that they had places of worship he says no this is about the church huh? and he said I advance in Judaism beyond many of my contemporaries in my own nation being what being more e exceedingly zealous for what the traditions of my fathers what was those traditions leading him to righteousness not at all look at it come on now but when it pleased God who separated me from my mother's womb this was the point of Paul's conversion and transformation he says when it pleased God who separated from my mother's womb and called me through his grace to reveal who his son we're in me notice is not to reveal Christianity to me that I can leave from Judaism to Christianity is to know Christ not the one they made, not the religion they made about him called Christianity, but to know him. Uh, and he says, re reveal his son in me. What did he why did he reveal his son in him? That I may preach him. Notice it's not preach the religion, it's preach him. Christ. Hello, somebody. Among who? If he preached Christ among Gentiles, then all Gentiles run and go look for holy day and Sabbath and circumcision. He says, hey, that was not preached to them. That was the Jews' religion. And it wasn't the Jews' religion. He preached to the Gentiles. He says, I did not immediately confer with flesh and blood. Nor did I go up to Jerusalem to those who were apostles before me. But I went to where? Arabia returned again to where? Damascus. Yes. And then after three years, that's not after three years chilling out, then he just show up and he say, no, three years of ministering the word here. That's what he's saying. 
after three years i went up to jerusalem to see peter and remained with him 15 days and saw none of the other apostles except who james the lord's brother now concerning the things he says which i write to you indeed before god i do not lie in other words paul is implying here that there are some rumors that some other people insight and train and tutor him oh forgive this word and he says uh -uh, none of them was there except peter and james and i was already declaring this thing three years before that before I even consulted one of them hear the word what he's saying and he says now come on to it says i write this in other words says this is putting writing to you before god and i do not lie he says afterwards i went into the regions of syria and cilicia and what and i was unknown by face to the churches of judah so there were churches in judah what they are not of judaism nor were they called christians yet come on now so the religion wasn't even formed yet for them to call christianity but it wasn't the church already active before there was christianity i wanted to understand something here so he says i was unknown by face to the churches of judea which were what in christ but they were hearing only what he who formerly persecuted us look at that is not who formerly persecuted our religion he who formerly persecuted us now preaches the faith which he once tried to destroy and they what they glorified god in me come on somebody that is sound doctrine sound minister sure word that is declared say there's no waver in here no so the word is sound and it is sure hello so look at what paul is saying why we come to the second chapter that paul now has to mention in the letter though he's writing to the galatians and he was there with them physically he said he's writing to them to identify to them put it in writing that this was why there was some uh, conflict some uh, altercation between him and peter and he wanted them to understand this was squash right on the very floor you know this was not physics right where it happened we never need no second meeting and follow up to clarify the matter you get the thing look at it what he said he says then after what fourth now you do all the calculation because some years not to be mentioned where it was at sicilian and where it was at syria right and so he, he, he but he mentioned three years after going to peter and then he said he went to other country and then he says after 14 years now you know say that a whole lot of years there we're talking somewhat in the region of 20 years give or take of you huh? and he's saying that then i went up to what jerusalem again with barnabas and also took titus with me and went up by revelation communicated to them what that gospel which i preach among whom and if him says then one doctrine is one gospel was there a different gospel for the jews watch this so that's why he's saying it like this you know because he's not writing just to give them a history and where he's coming from and this testimony of how he got saved he's writing because he's addressing them now about an issue they have seen some jews came down there and tell them said jesus was a jew and you guys are gentiles and jesus was circumcised and you guys are uncircumcised jesus was keeping feast days and ceremony as a jew and you guys not keeping none and they thought that oh you look like we never hear the gospel that's why paul start and say there is only one 
That's why Paul said it to them in this way to say to them, they have moved to another gospel which is not another. Ah, uh, that's why I said in Galatians 1 verse 6. It moved to another gospel which is what? Not another, but he says, there are some who seek to pervert the gospel. In other words, they are trying to carry in the religion into the gospel. And it says the gospel was never meant to be a religious message. Never. Religion was here already and it wasn't saving anybody. It only really put them in bondage. But it says whom the son set free. Ah, come on. What did he say to them? I marvel you are turning away so soon from him who called you in the grace of Christ to a different gospel which is not another in other words there's no two gospel one for Jews and one for Gentiles no he said there are some who trouble you and want to pervert the gospel of Christ and what he said about that let them be accursed come on somebody reject turn from such he says turn away hello come on now so that's why he said then in galatians 2 the, the, the issue arrives now when peter come down there <coughs> because there there's some differences of how they're still operating as jews in jerusalem and a strong influence of judaism their former religion and, and this is where the class come when they come amongst Gentiles now who, who Paul have been ministered to now over 18 to 20 years now just by the years he mentioned for he didn't mention the years of all of them huh? the places that he went but he still, still said I went up to Jerusalem and they heard huh? yeah? I, I, after 14 years he said I went up to to went up by revelation and communicated to them that gospel which i preach among whom the gentiles but privately to those who were what of reputation less by any means i might run or had run in because the purpose of the apostles prophets and evangelists is to unite people in the faith and in the knowledge of the son is not in the knowledge of the religion Christianity it's the knowledge of Christ I keep emphasizing that for you to see the difference come on now you got it he says but privately to those who were of reputation less by any means I run or had run in vain yet not even Titus who was with me being a Greek was compelled to be circumcised. So though he went up the in Jerusalem part, they have strong sense of Judaism part. Those who uncircumcised now they come in at the temple and come amongst their worship. He said, not even Titus was a Gentile and bring with him uncircumcised. They never turn and say you need to circumcise him. You know? remember says Jerusalem is in now. Come on. He said there was no compelling to be circumcised and and Titus, though being a Greek, a Gentile, so it was signed there enough to show to them it's time to put aside your religious belief and claim true faith in Christ. Hello, somebody, you got it? And what he says, and this occurred because of what. False brethren secretly brought in who came in by stealth to do what? Spy out our liberty which we have in who? In Christ Jesus that they might bring us into what? Back in their religion. Come on. In other words, some will come in like they leave the religion but still want to seduce you back in it. They will frame you to get you. What you say? Uh -huh. So he says, to whom we did not yield submission even for an hour. Paul said, we're not giving them no break. 
We're not giving them no cause to even think they're right because they're wrong. Come on. That the truth of the gospel, what? Might continue with you. Come on, somebody. Huh? But from those who seem to be something, whatever they were, Paul said, it makes no difference to me. It could have been the bishop of Montego Bay. And he said, it makes no Oh, you understand that one? Oh, eh, eh? No, man, never said no. You have to remember now, you have different generals. And, uh, uh, you know, those who have great big mega churches, you know. You have to be careful now, those, those guys, you know. They have influence and power, you know. Uh, you know? Uh, no, I don't know. But I know in whom I believe. And I'm persuaded that he's able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. What do you say? Hello. He says, what did Paul say? God shows personal favoritism to no man. Is that clear? Loud and clear. For those who seem to be something, Paul said, added nothing to me. Come on now. Give me more. Hallelujah. But on the contrary, when they saw that what? The gospel for the uncircumcised had been committed to me. As the gospel for the circumcised was to who? Peter. For he who worked effectively in Peter for the apostleship to the circumcised also worked effectively in me towards the Gentiles. Is that clear? The same one working in him is working in me. That's what Paul was saying. Paul wasn't saying here is two different gospel. One for the Gentile Paul preaching and one for the Jews. Peter preaching. No, he says it's the same gospel. We all, Jew and Gentiles, had to believe in Christ to gain that righteousness of God. He says the law didn't give it to us. Circumcision in the flesh did not give it to us. We got that righteousness through faith in Christ. You got it? Watch this. So he says, when James, talking of him as the Lord's brother, this was one who was uh, uh, one of the children who uh, Mary had, who was one of the brothers who didn't believe in Christ while Christ was there. But after Christ rose from the dead and appeared to many and many believed on him, then he now being flesh brother to Jesus, being born of Mary, they appoint him, say, if he's brother to Jesus, he is like a pillar to the church. And that's why Paul speaking like that say, God no see no favorites here enough, son. If you don't have the word click together, you're kind of half. You need to come and make sure you're ego. You, you, you watch what Paul is saying here. Watch if it has no impact on what he says next year. He says, when James, Cephas, and John who seem to be what? Pillars perceive the grace that had been given to me. They gave me and Barnabas what? The right, in other words, they say, right on, brother. You got the thing. There is nothing there to be altered, to be adjusted, to be monitored. You got the thing, bullseye. Come on now. And he says what? We, that we should go to the Gentiles and they to who? Because it's the one message they bring into both. The Gentiles and to the circumcised. So they said they're going to the circumcised, which are the Jews, and they and Paul and Barnabas and Titus going to the uncircumcised, which are the Gentiles. You got it? And what he says, they desire only that we should what? Remember the poor and the, the very thing which I also was eager to do. So I said, that was not was remembering them anyway. Uh, that wasn't something new of a responsibility on me. But what he said, but now when Peter had come to Antioch, 
And it was at Antioch that they were first called Christians. And it wasn't Gentile believers that called themselves Christians. It's Worlian called them Christians. And mockingly so. To say, see them there like the one of them put on the cross. It was not to honor them. And that's why later you find Peter saying, if anyone is called a Christian, they did not be ashamed. It wasn't said as something to honor them when they call them Christians. I must remember, say it's not Christians that they call themselves Christians. Woohoo! Just giving you an up to date that you can know it go. Hello, keeping you in power with what really happened here. So it says, when Peter had what? Come to Antioch. I withstood him to his face. Paul is saying, do this man walk with Jesus while Jesus was here. And I come some 30 years after when they stoned Stephen. I was a little boy holding close till I grew up. Passionate about my Jewish religion. And, and they make me the star boy to persecute them. He says, yet still though this man was senior as one who walked with Jesus. When he come down there, not truly holding to the truthfulness of the gospel, I rebuke him publicly. You need to understand why Paul was saying before, seem to be pillars of the church. Because he's saying when he come to the gospel, there is no other gospel. You hearing it? You come on now. Huh? And what did he say about that? <laughs> he said he withstood him to his face. He didn't took him aside privately and, and he rebuked him. <laughs> he said because he was to be blamed for before certain what? So who he says certain men come from? Aha. The, one who want to, the ones who want to stay ministering the gospel to the Jews. He says, some corruption happened there that now when they come amongst Gentiles, they acting funny. They act differently when they be the Jews. But when they come amongst Gentile believers, the behavior changing, what's there? And he says, Peter didn't have that behavior before till certain men come from James. And he know they're going to carry back report to James. What they see and what they hear and what they see Peter doing. And Peter was very much influenced by that. And it changed his behavior to the Gentiles. Look at that in verse 12. For before certain men came from James, he would eat with the Gentiles. That was before they come. And we know the Gentiles was eating according to Judaism restrictive laws of death of not eating certain four foot beasts and split hooves and meat like that of the color we call unclean these gentiles were eating anything because they weren't taught that as a means of being saved they were taught about faith in christ as means to be saved got it so he said he was free to eat so with them until these men came and when they came he withdrew and separated himself fearing those who were what those jews come on now and the rest of the jews what also played the hypocrite with him Man, when, Pete, when Paul writes like that, Paul the state right this so clearly say, Peter, they go on like a hypocrite. In writing, recorded letter that now becomes scripture. I'm talking to you. I want you to know, say, this, this gospel not up for debate. Ah, oh, God. It's not up to be altered according to your geographic location and to your custom and your culture. Hello? You need to know there is one gospel. Yeah? 
And he says, when they came, he withdrew and separated himself, fearing those who were of the circumcision. And the rest of the Jews, what? Played the hypocrite with him so that even Barnabas, Barnabas who was with Paul, my God, was carried away with their hypocrisy. Come on. Huh? And what Paul said, but when I saw that they were what? They were not straightforward about the truth of the gospel. I said to Peter before them all, I didn't take Peter said and said, Peter, no, you know what you're doing. You're an illness, so come and me talk to you. <laughs> no. Paul said, well, that man. I, I say to Peter before them all, if you, Peter, being a Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles, in other words, you was living here like a Gentile. Where the Gentile? We couldn't tell you have a different diet, dietary law regulating what you eat because everything the Gentile eat, you're eating with them. Watch the thing, what Paul said. What Paul said, if you be not Jew, live in the manner of Gentiles and not as the Jews. Because it's the Jews at those dietary laws. Come on now. Why do you compel Gentiles now? He said, by your withdrawal, you are showing say, something was wrong with what they was doing. And now you're separating yourself to tell them, say, they better seize if they want to get back your company. He says, now you, by your action, you're compelling Gentiles to live as Jews. Ah! Remember, this that happened at Antioch was not something that happened at Galatia. So why is Paul writing to the Galatians and mentioning this with Peter? Because the similar effect of things happen now to the Galatians that were Gentiles that came through the gospel. That Jews went down to them to introducing Judaism. Come on now. And perverting the gospel. Yeah. Come on now, somebody. Huh? And Paul had to bring up that case to show them, say, even when it was Peter who missed it, he never spared for tell him before and face. That's why Paul is saying now, that's why I have all confidence to rebuke you, even when we don't present in a letter, because you miss it to go join the Judaizers. Come on now. You get it? So Paul wasn't making mention of this with Peter for them to somehow have some low image and reflection and response to Peter. He was using this to show his unrelenting passion and zeal to do it according to how Christ gave it to him and having no excuse for anything to be altered to suit somebody because who is in the crowd. But he said, this Peter did. And this Barnabas did. And I had to rebuke them. Before them. To let them see, say, this was not acceptable. Hello? Come on now. Huh? He, what he said to Peter. We who are, are Jews by nature. Why did he say Jews by nature? This was not a spiritual done thing done for them to be Jews. <laughs> they had blood relation to those who were the ancestors that were really declared and called Jews. Huh? Hebrews would be most that they were called by the language. Huh? But he said Jews more what so known as those who came out of Egypt or wandering in the land till they had their own land. Jews actually, the word Jew actually means nomad, you know. It means nomad. The persons who are wandering looking for their own land. So they got that name Jew when they were wandering looking for their land till God brought them in their own land. 
and it still stuck with them, but it was a name given to them by Gentiles. Ah, huh? you got it? So, so he says, we, we live in a manner of Jews, and by nature we are Jews, not sinners of the Gentiles. In other words, he says, we, we didn't grow like Gentiles. We grew as Jews. That's why he says, Jews by nature. Later you find that Paul said, refer to the Jews as the natural vine, and refer to the Gentiles as what? The, the, the wild vine that was engrafted into the natural one. You get it? So they say, they were naturally trained. So what was their natural training the Lord used to bring them in? It was faith in Christ that brought them in. You got it? Look at this. So it says, we who are Jews by nature and not sinners of the Gentiles. What? Knowing that a man what? A man is not justified, means to be made righteous, straight, accurate, and, and good standing with God by the works of the law. But what was he made righteous by? So if Paul says, we, we natural Jews know that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith in Christ, it means that even they as Jews were not declared righteous by their law. Look what it's, he's saying. We know that a man is not justified by the works of the law. But by faith in Jesus, even we, speaking of we, there is speaking Peter and himself as natural Jews. He says, even we have believed in Christ Jesus that we might be justified by faith in Christ and not by the works of the law. Why? For by the works of the law, no flesh, come on now, shall be declared righteous. Huh? Does he then give license that because we're not going by the works of the law, then we can't do anything? We can't live any kind of immoral life and say, we're under grace? No, he says, because he said, but if while we seek to be justified by Christ, we ourselves are found what? If we still engage in sin, is Christ therefore a minister of sin? Did he say yes? No, he said certainly not. For if I build again those things which I destroy, I make myself what? A transgressor. Come on. He's, he's making it clear. He's not going back to live according to the flesh. Because remember, he said, those who live according to the flesh will die. But those who live according to the spirit will have life and life more abundantly. Come on. For he says, I through the law, what? I died to the law. What did I die to the law? To live, to live lawless? No, I died to the law that I might live to God. Woo! Come on. I have been what? Crucified with Christ. That's where he said it. It is no longer I who live, but who? Christ lives in me. That's the same word I was sharing with you in 1 John 4. Verse 3, 2 and 3, where was telling you, one who confesses that Christ came in the flesh. is not just in his flesh, in the flesh. And if he come in the flesh and he says in you, he's in your flesh. And he's saying then, he, his life must be revealed in you. Because you said you received him. You didn't receive the religion. It's him you receive. Come on now. You see it? That's why Paul said, it's no longer I who live. No longer I who live. But Christ lives in me. So he said, oh, you're going to get me in a sin. And we don't know Christ in a sin. Come on now. You get the thing? 
Because he says, I'm not relying on the old me to live this life. If I rely on that old me, that would be like going under the law. The law was given to the old me. The old me was a sinner. Was unrighteous, was ungodly. That was the who the law was given for. But I say, I can't be in Christ now. Christ in me and submitted to what is for the ungodly. Because I say, what the law was given, it wasn't for the righteous. It's for the ungodly. You don't tell an honest man, thou shalt not lie. It would be an insult to him. It would be implying that what he's saying is a lie. You don't say to a man who's honestly dealt business with you and giving you your share and you said you must not steal. It would be accusing of being dishonest. It only applies where people have been violating those principles. And he says, why then you think they got the law? If they were not doing it, you think they would get it? Come on now. So that's why Paul said the law is good if one uses it what? Lawfully. In other words, there's a lawful way to use the law. And we know there's a, that, that's the reason why even the police that they would say are lawmen are sometimes interrogated. No, sir. Brought in for questioning. Why? Because they can abuse the law. They can wrongfully use it against someone who is innocent. Got it? Then the law will be used unlawfully. It's still a law used, but he's not using it lawfully. So he says the, the law is good if one what? If one uses the law what? Lawfully. How do they use it lawfully? He said they must know this. This is something they need to know to use the law lawfully. The law is not made for a righteous person. Lord have mercy. That's a bomb for some. They don't get that all now. Huh? He says it's not for a righteous person. It's for the lawless. For the insubordinate, for the ungodly and for sinners, for the unholy and profane, for murderers of fathers and murderers of mothers, for manslayers, for fornicators, for sodomites, for kidnappers, for liars, for perjurers. You know, they would say liars and then say perjurers and say, but uh, what's the difference between lying and perjurers? Uh, liars will say things that are not true but perjurers will swear to things that are not true and that's when they say someone is found guilty of perjury in the court because they took a note to speak the truth before they speak and then when they speak the lie they take a sweet note to that lie and so they say they have committed perjury also so he says, perjurers, and there, if there's any other thing that is what? Contrary to sound doctrine, what Paul said. He says, according to the glorious gospel. In other words, he says, is the gospel that tell him that the law is not meant for the righteous. He says, according to the glorious gospel of the blessed God, which was committed to my trust. He's telling Timothy that. So he says, it is useful, yes, but don't use it. And people who God has cleansed. That, that's, that's why the Lord had to rebuke Peter in a dream when he, he was when the Lord said, kill and eat. And what did Peter say? Lord, for my was a youth have never put those things in my mouth and defile myself. Though he knew Jesus teach him already that not no man put in his, own, in his mouth defiles him. He knew Jesus already gave him that teaching. But in his subconscious evening dream, he's saying to God who tell him to kill and eat. No, I never put that in my mouth and defile myself. And what did the Lord say to him? Why do you call 
and clean what I have cleansed. What God has cleansed, you must not call common. If God cleanses it, it's well cleansed. <laughs> Hallelujah. Come on. Huh? Three times he had that vision. And it took a while before it soaked in Peter. What the Lord was saying to him. And now years after, Paul had to be rebuking him about the very same thing. Now you will join because some Jews come to see you eating with the Gentiles. Lord have mercy. You think it was a joke? Why, why Paul, Paul was mentioning Galatians? So when he went into Jerusalem by the Holy Spirit, only Peter he saw because he sensed a need to connect with Peter with the word God gave to him. Because God was already giving the word to Peter. You know? But Peter got quite comfortable amongst the Jews. <laughs> Peter got quite comfortable amongst the Jews, man. But God, knowing Peter, sent someone to take the baton and carry it on for him to take it to the Gentiles. And someone had to come to connect with him to let him know the work God has signed to you is still being done. And it's a shame that he had to come down and come look at the work and now Paul had to be rebuking him publicly because of some misdemeanor of how his behavior was that was conflicting with the faith. That they now come in Christ. Come on, somebody. Because he, he should have gathered this already. And what you keep stumbling on will cause you to stumble. Come on now. Because you must mature in the Lord to overcome that thing. Now, so, and if you keep on weighing it and weighing it and not getting it, you will never get it. Has anyone had told somebody already anything you keep on saying it too hard, it too hard, you'll never do it. Come on. Because you must make up your mind at a certain point and say, this needs to be done and we're going to get it done. So, as long as you keep wavering and weighing and weaning and buffing and you're not going nowhere. Come on. Because you have to make up your mind. If God be God, then serve him. No, sir. But you can't be wavering between two decisions. When the Lord said the double-minded receive nothing from him. Those are double-minded. He said they are like the waves of the sea. Tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. Just like what Paul said. The apostles and prophets and evangelists are given to you that you be no longer children. Tossed to and fro with every wind of doctrine. No longer children. Because he said, it will make you become double-minded. And those who are double-minded, he says, they are unstable in all their ways. Come on. God doesn't build on what is unstable. You must become stable for God to release some things he has for you. Come on. Who builds a house on an unstable ground? He said, that's the foolish man that builds his house on his son. But the wise man built his house on the rock because his foundation is stable. You get it? So the Lord wants us to know that when we come into the knowledge of the truth, it shifts our position. Huh? It shifts our way of reasoning and belief and thought and view. And Paul had to let them know it's one gospel. Come on now. It's not two. You must come to the point and recognize that where we have turned from the gospel, it's going to be a heartbreak for us with the Lord. Come on now. Because God wants us to acknowledge and declare to people. When you're talking to people and people ask about what faith are you of, you need to make it clear to them that is, there is one faith. Come on. Paul was consistent in all his writings about this. One faith. One Lord, one baptism. You see it? One God and Father of us all. 
So he says, you need to understand that that oneness that he speaks about is not no different faith for Jews than for Gentiles. It's one. So he says, that's why Gentiles don't have to become Jews to be saved. Because he never, he never said for God so loved the Jews that he gave his only son. He said for God so loved the world. And that spoke of all nations. Come on. The Lord told Abraham in the promise that you will be the father of many nations. He didn't say be the father of one nation. The Israel is only one nation. That nation of Jews is only one. But he speaks of being the father of many. Ah, and that means the Lord says through that seed that was coming all the nations of the earth what? Shall be blessed. Come on. But who are they blessed through? Christ. It's not true Israel. It's not true the Jews. It's true the Son of God. The Son of God came through the Jews because they were the first people, the first nation God had a covenant with. And that was tailored through the whole of the Old Testament. But the New Testament now has a new body called the body of Christ, which is the church. Huh? And the church comprised of Jews and Gentiles that the Lord said he has made into one body now in Christ. Huh? So he said, you can't go back to the old man trying to go fishing after old, 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 old principles. And will not touch, not taste, not. He said, these things perish with the using. You need to know and come into a full maturity about Christ. Huh? You see, religion itself at a place. Let me give it for some persons to understand. Because uh, even James spoke that there is a pure religion. Huh? James said there is what? Yeah, man, a, pure, a pure religion. So it says, what, what is that pure religion to? To what? Huh? There it is on the screen. Pure and undefiled religion before God and the Father is what? Is this? To what? Visit the orphans and widows in their trouble. And to what? Look at that latter part. To keep oneself unspotted from the world. Come on. To keep oneself what? Unspotted from the... That's, that's speaking about sin, baby. Come on now. You agree? So, which religion keep you unspotted in the world? There's none. It's Christ that keep you unspotted in the world. Got it? Right? So it still come back to Christ. All the teachers pointed to Christ. Anyone that didn't point to Christ as the means of salvation was in error. Huh? That's why Paul said in Romans 10, speaking about the Jews, he said they had, they had zeal towards righteousness. They have a zeal, but they lack according to knowledge. Huh? That's in Romans 10, from verse 1 to verse 3. Paul says, Brethren, my heart desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they may be saved. I bear them witness that they have a zeal for God. They have a zeal. But not according to knowledge. Why? For they being ignorant of God's righteousness. What did they do? Seeking to establish their own righteousness. Have not submitted to the righteousness of God. Come on. It is Christ who is the righteousness of God. 
It's not Christianity, it's not Judaism. Come on, somebody. They have not truly submitted to Christ. Hello, somebody. Christ is what? The righteousness of God. He said, he became sin for us that we would become the righteousness of God in Christ. Come on. He made him who knew no sin to be sin for us that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Huh? And is there any righteousness perfect more than the righteousness of God? Oh my God. Then if you become the righteousness of God, it's not perfect. My God. And then who going to find fault with what the Lord has cleansed? <laughs> who is going to find fault with what the Lord has cleansed? Who can call what God has made clean? Come on. He calls them a holy nation. A peculiar people, royal priesthood, kings and priests unto God. Huh? Holy as he is holy. Glory to God. Righteous as he is righteous. The wisdom of God in Christ. What well, you say? That sounds good to me. Praise God. And anything good must be God. Hallelujah. Because God is good. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. And anything that is not of God is not good. Hello, somebody. That's how we can know what is of God and what is not. Come on now, somebody. Because it's not, the Lord said, it's not what a man eats that defiles. It's what comes out of his mouth. For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. And what he says comes out of a man's mouth. Sin. Did you know? It, Peter at the time just was correcting him about that. He never truly embraced it. And that's why later he had to be in dream. And later Paul had to come and rebuke him about it. He need to understand his principle. Peter an answered and said to Jesus, Explain this parable to us. Note here, Jesus did not give a parable. Jesus was giving a teaching, plain and simple. But Peter was struggling to receive this because when he's a little boy, he's sticking to Jewish diet. Watch this. And he says, explain this parable to us. So Jesus said to him, are you also still without understanding? Peter is talking to. He says, do you not yet understand that whatever enters the mouth goes into the stomach and it is eliminated now it don't go into your heart <laughs> hello but those things which proceed out of the mouth comes from the heart and they defile a man and what are those things he says for well, out of the heart proceeds what evil thoughts Murders, adulteries, fornication, thefts, false witness, blasphemies. Huh? These are the things which defile a man. But to eat with unwashed hands does not defile a man. Why do you think they're talking about eating with unwashed hands? Because they believe... Dirt can transmit, and some unclean thing can be transmitted from their hands whenever they eat it. And you eat that unclean thing, man, you unclean too. Anything you eat with unwashed hands is unclean. And if you eat something unclean, you're unclean too. That was their mentality. And the Lord says, No, it's not what the man eat make him unclean. Is what is going on in his heart. Oh, you got it? Come on now. And that, so that, of course, was what the Lord was correcting. And years later, still had to be correcting it with Peter. Paul coming on the scene as a young minister. 
have to be correcting him publicly on it because he still have some issue with the correction on that one man. Yeah, what you say sometimes people can be able to receive correction and you don't tell them but do you, each person have to internalize the word after what internalize the word and take the word personal because you can be there and say yes and what in your heart you they say eh, eh, eh. you know what i mean Right, so you have to know how to internalize the word because until you do, you and the word will have conflict. You will have a resting with the word. And Paul wrote about that. Well, Peter wrote about that in Second Peter 3. Uh, he wrote about that with Paul. That Paul wrote things that he had received as revelation from the Lord. What he had what? Receive what? Revelation. This wisdom that was given to him. Peter said it was given to him by the Lord. No, sir? It's in 2 Peter 3, verse 15 to 16. It says, And consider that the long suffering of our Lord is what? Salvation, as also our beloved brother Paul, according to the wisdom given to him, has written to you, as also in all his epistles, speaking in them of what? These things in which are some things hard to understand, which are some things what? Hard to understand, which untaught and unstable people twist to what? Twist to their own destruction as they also do what? When he said the rest of the scripture is implying, indicating there, that Paul's letters were scriptures. That's why it says, they twist what he writes, and they also do, they also do the rest, the rest of the scriptures. Therefore, he said, Paul's letters were scriptures. He didn't just quote it from Old Testament writings to scriptures, but his letters were scriptures. And he said, the wisdom given to him is according to the Lord. Come on, somebody. You got it? So it can be trusted and taken as word. And he says, those who wrestle with it, wrestle to their own destruction. They suffer the consequences of wrestling with the word. We are not called to wrestle with the word. We are called to submit to the word. We are not called to, 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 to argue and debate and, 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 and find reasons to go around the word. He says, no, submit. Submit to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. That's how you get the winning age over the devil all the time. Because the devil may quote from the word, but he will not abide in the word. So if you are abiding the word, you get the life of the word. And the life of the word is eternal life. And the devil don't have it. I know the devil don't have eternal life. <laughs> Hallelujah. Glory to God because Jesus referred to the devil as a murderer. In John 8 verse 44. And he says, no murderer has eternal life in him. That's what John what? First John 2, 1 John 3, verse 1. Praise God. Verse 14. Hallelujah. Verse 15. He says, we know that we have passed from what? Death to life because we love who? The brethren. He who does not love his brother abides in what? He abides in death. Whoever hates his brother is what? Is a murderer. And you know that no murderer, that included them, no murderer has eternal life abiding in him. Come on. Cain never had eternal life. He didn't love his brother. And the word of God says Cain was of the wicked one. Who is the wicked one? The devil. And he says, why did he murder his brother? Because he practiced evil. His brother practiced righteousness. Come on. He's of a different spirit. Though they were brothers in the flesh, they were no related in the spirit. <laughs> Hallelujah. 
Because God's family is not marked by the flesh. It's marked by the spirit. And that's why I say test the spirit. Whether they be of God or not. Not so. Because if Christ is in the flesh, you're going to sense and know that he is there based on how they operate. Not so. Hallelujah. Come on, give God the praise. Give God a better praise than that, man. Yes, man. Praise God. All right, we're going to give you some questions and answers and comments and rebuttals. Give you a chance to do so. You can step up to the mic and ask your questions and give your comments or rebuttals. And also those online can type in their comments or questions there and we we'll give due diligence to it time to get them answered as much as we have time tonight to get to as much as we can out here and online. Amen. Praise God. All right, your time. You can give your voice to the to the teaching. Good evening, Apostle. Good evening, Praise everyone. God. Yes. Um, Apostle, what stood out to me was when you said that um, when we confess that Christ came in the flesh, we are also confessing that He comes in our flesh. And right. once He comes and abides and abides in our flesh, then it is impossible for us to sin. So we will always live a righteous life. Mm -hmm. So that really stood out to me. I know you say it a lot of times, you know, but yeah. it just me just feel like my spirit just grabby when you yes. said so. Yes, and also when you said that we must reach a point of maturity in the Lord that whatever the devil used to make us unstable in the past will not cause us to be unstable again while living for the Lord. And, you know, um, it's not that we won't be tempted, but mm -hmm. now we have the word of God and the Holy Spirit to help us to overcome those temptations. So thank you for the word, Apostle. I, I, I felt my spirit feeding and, you know, I felt when it just dropped in there like that. Praise Thank you for God. the word. Bless God. Come on, give him the praise. Hallelujah. You see, because the, it is the Christ coming in us is more than just receiving information about Christ. You, can, you know you can receive information about a person and don't know them. And why you can, you can get to know a person that person did you give you much information about and you know them you see so in knowing is more than just having the information it's about that relationship with that person to know huh that fellowship that happened between you and them and so there must be a fellowship a bonding with you and christ that makes you come into the reality of what it means to be joint ears with him that partnership with you and Christ must merge and take effect by this consummation in the way you operate, in the way you talk, in the reason that you realize it's no longer just you. It's him living in you. And that's what Paul was saying in Galatians 2 verse 20. I, I live yet not I. I, it's, I no longer live, but it's Christ who lives in me. Huh? And the life that he says he now living in the flesh is living by faith in him who lives in him. The son of God. He believes that Christ is really living in his body. That his body is now a vehicle to transmit and move Christ in the earth. And that's what Paul was talking about when he says present that body to the Lord as a living sacrifice. And which devil can take over this body when the Lord in charge Hallelujah. Glory to God. Hallelujah. No devil from hell can win because the Lord is bigger. Huh? Any creature must submit to him. Every knee will bow of things in heaven, of things on the earth, and things under the earth and confess that he is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Amen. Praise God. Anyone else? Come on. Yes, man, bring it. Praise Good God. night, Apostle. Good night, um, What stood out to me? All right, so we must know who the Lord has sent us to. Yes. Um, uh, persons probably don't take things that they learn in the natural, in the spiritual, because when you're at school, I'll use school as an example, mm -hmm. and you have great teachers, and say you have six, grade six, 
and all of them have their great classes and you have your homeroom teacher, you belong to that homeroom teacher. In a similar way, we belong to a specific shepherd, so we report to that person, that person oversees us. That's right. And when you said that we need to internalize the word and take it personal, so it's not like we take some of it and leave some of it and say it doesn't belong to us, but everything is for our benefit. Mm -hmm. There's one more. <laughs> yes. Um, the point of Paul playing the hypocrite. It mm -hmm. just um, reminded me Peter. of a, Peter, right, mm -hmm. sorry, Peter. Reminded me of an incident with a co-worker. Who he, he's an Adventist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I remember one day I had to, I normally accommodate him and have him switch around so he's not working on the Saturday night or the Friday evening to the Saturday. But this one time I had to say, you have to come to work. And he was adamant that he's not coming to work. He did not show for work. And I said, you know, it's so hypocritical of him not to do that. But yeah, I hear, like, I'll pass by and hear the conversation that he's engaging with the other workers and the things that they, they do and say and they're like, and the things that they, the lifestyle is just not lining up with what they want to do. And they know that the works that they're, not, that they're doing is not saving them, but they still continue with the dead works. Jesus spoke to the Jews about that too. He says, though they are trying to enforce the law against others, he says to them, even you are not obeying the law. The Lord was obeying it, and they're trying to enforce it, and the Lord was obeying it. And the Lord said, but even you are not doing it. They're enforcing on others not to work on this day, but if any one of your sheep fall in the wall on this day, you're not leaving it for the next day and make no lion and wolf devour it. And it takes a lot of manpower to get that sheep out of that hole because that sheep is not going to any and anybody. And you can't send in a rope and cast it over the sheep and they can dry him up. You have to send down shepherd rope on his waist and send down shepherd down the hole because it is shepherd the sheep going to. The shepherd have to send down in the hole with manpower. And then the shepherd take the sheep under his arm and they pull up shepherd and sheep out of the hole. Come on now. They know if they just send a man down there to take out that sheep. Even when they hold the sheep and carry up the sheep, the sheep will jump out of his arm to the death in that hole. You know? Just to be away from one he doesn't know. So that's why he just was using that, that, that analogy. To say that his sheep, they know his voice and they follow him. They don't run from him. They run to him. Huh? Yeah, man, that's why I mean, I run down who they run from. Him because, you know, say, anyone is mine, they will come. Yeah, but if they're not coming, me not running them down. Because the Lord has drawn people to me by the Spirit. It's not some carnal and, and some worldly methods I use to capture them and bring them in here. No, it's all through the Holy Spirit. Huh? And if it's not of the Holy Spirit, I'm not in it. Hello? So the whole means of bringing them is still by the Word and the Holy Spirit. And that, if that don't work, nothing else is not going to work. Hallelujah. Because that's how children of God are made. By the Word and the Holy Spirit. So if that won't work for you, then it's good for you not to be here. Praise God. Because it's the word and the Holy Spirit that makes you true children of God. Huh? Praise God. So that's why we want them to come and squash out the thing with the one. They will clear up the thing quick. <laughs> Hallelujah. Yes, man. Next. Anyone? Anyone? Come on. Bring it. Hallelujah. Bless the Lord. <laughs> Hallelujah. Good night, everyone. Good night. Um, Apostle, can you explain what is the righteousness of God and yes. how that applies to us as being children of God, please? Praise God. All right. The righteousness of men uh, is different from the righteousness of God. In, in the terms of righteousness of men, men do things that seem right in their own eyes. And the word of God says there's a way that appeareth right unto a man. It seemed right to him, but the end thereof is death. It bleeds to death. 
In other words, sin has corrupted man's mind to make him see things in an, in an abstract manner, in a way that often leads to error, guessing, or confusion. And the Lord is saying, his way is perfect. He sees the total sum. So when he reveals his way and said, this is the way, it's right and targeted. It doesn't miss, not to the left, not to the right. It's right and target. You get it? And that's what it says. It's the righteousness of God. Means that God sees things on a greater level than we do. So when he said right, it is not an assumption, presumption, or some ideology. He have just shared an idea. No, he sees the full picture, sums it up, and relates. And the word is bullseye. Get it? So he's saying when we receive his righteousness now, we are receiving it through his word and through his Holy Spirit. The word comes with the instruction and with the declaration of what he declares is right. And the Holy Spirit comes with the power for us to be endued with the right heart and mentality to do what the word says. So both works together to produce the righteousness of God. So that's why Jesus oftentimes the word would be speaking to those in the Old Testament and said, your ways are not my ways. Your thoughts are not my thoughts. My thoughts are higher than your thoughts. So now the Lord is revealing that to us through his word and through his Holy Spirit. And when we submit to the word and the Holy Spirit, we come into what is called the righteousness of God. So that's why he says, Christ needed to die. He needed to become sin for us, to remove sin from us totally. So he says, he that knew no sin became sin for us, that we would become what? The righteousness of God in him. Hallelujah. And God's righteousness is perfect. Hallelujah. So that's why he refers to it in in Hebrews, what? Hebrews 10 verse 14 or 10 verse 13. I always mix it. 10 verse 14, he says, By one sacrifice, he has what? By one offering, he has perfected forever who? He has perfected forever those who are being sanctified. But the Holy Spirit also witnessed to us for after, after he had said before, after he had said before, huh? after he said before, this is the covenant that I will make with them. After those days, said the Lord, I will put my laws in their hearts and in their minds, I will write them. So the word is more than just looking on word written on tablets of stone. Now he says, the word is now in our hearts. That's not written like you can't go in your, your physical heart and see something written in there. It's in your spirit. He says, no, he's encoding it like your DNA in your being. And that is done through his Holy Spirit and his word. Encoding the instructions and releasing the power to carry out the instructions. And he says, that makes you right all the time. And who love righteousness that don't love to write all the time? I know those who love to write sometimes don't love righteousness where they should. When you love righteousness, you want to be right all the time. And you can be right all the time. Why? Because God is right all the time. And if you follow God, you will be right all the time. That's why I say in Ephesians 5 verse 1, be imitators of God as is. Dear children, huh? Praise God. So we come into that by faith. Faith in the word and faith in the leadership of his Holy Spirit in our lives. I think it was uh, John, what, uh, Romans 5 verse 20 and 21. Is that the righteousness of God is now revealed again apart from the law. Is that it? Hallelujah. Praise God. Hallelujah. Romans 3. Oh yes, Romans 3 verse 20 to 21. Yeah. It says, therefore, by the deeds of the law, no flesh shall be justified in his sight, for the law is, 
it, for by the law is the what the knowledge of sin but now the what the righteousness of God apart from the law is revealed the righteousness of God what in other words we didn't use the law to get that righteousness what the law did was to condemn us and show us how great a sinner we were and how deeply bound in sin we were that made us cry out to God save me and God sent Christ to save us from our sin fill us with his Holy Spirit and give us a new sense of direction to his word to produce what the righteousness of God see it but now the righteousness of God apart from the law is what revealed being witnessed by the law and the prophets even the righteousness of God what through faith in who faith in Jesus Christ that's not just believing that Christ exists that is believing that Christ is living in you and believing that all he said about you is true that it and it says to all and on all who believe for there is what no difference come on hallelujah so so he says hey, for all have sinned and fall short of what the glory of god did he end there no he says being justified means being made righteous freely by his grace that's what justified means made righteous being justified freely by his grace through the redemption that is in who only in Christ you can have that redemption in Christ Jesus whom God set forth as what appropriation by his blood through faith to what to demonstrate his righteousness how is he demonstrating that righteousness through him living in us he already has that righteousness of God. But he says, that's what God set him forth as a preparation by his blood through faith to demonstrate his righteousness because in his forbearance, God had passed over what? The sins that were previously committed. Not sins we're committing now and continue to commit. No, he says, sins we previously committed because we turn from that to Christ. To demonstrate at the present time what his righteousness that he might be what just and the justifier of the one who has what faith in Jesus praise God got it so that righteousness perfect man we don't that righteousness don't need no makeup of circumcision and ceremonial and wearing special white color because if you wear white you're pure and if you wear pink and scarlet you can't clean no it's not so if we learn christ you know so some people still believe say it's so they show christ if they don't wear pure white they're not pure white and they're not pure if they don't wear pure white so you see them in a white shoes white hat white bag white stocking oh jesus and I'll know they're not pure. Praise God. Because they don't understand. It's not about your external appearance. It's about the life of Christ in you. Glory to God. Huh? And if the life is in you, then Paul says that the body is dead indeed to sin, but the spirit is life to righteousness. Huh? Glory to God. Anyone else? Glory to God. Good night. Uh, yes. Sister Wallace says, good Sister night. Sister Wallace, good night. <laughs> she says, good night, Apostle and family. Yes. What stood out to me is that when the Spirit of God dwells in us, we will be able to differentiate when another spirit is of God or not. Definitely. With that knowledge, we must not be ignorant that there are also spirits that are not of God. We are taught then that by the Holy Spirit through our apostle to fight effectively in the spirit knowing that those weapons are not carnal. Praise God. And you sister. Don't use carnal weapons to fight. 
Praise God. So we got to stay connected to Christ to use the spiritual weapons. And what are those spiritual weapons? The Word and the Holy Spirit. So we, that's why we take time to study and to gain knowledge in the Word. Because persons can feel something wrong and think because they feel the person is wrong or feel something is wrong, it's wrong. But that would be leading on their own understanding. But the Word of God gives us a different understanding. Huh? So when we gain knowledge in the Word, what happens then? We unlock the wisdom of God. We can then discern what the Lord is saying against this or for this. Huh? Gives us a clear means for vision and judgment. Amen. Yes, anyone else? Sister Rankin. Sister, Sister Rankin, Rankin, how are you doing, man? Yes, far away but online. Praise she God. said, I'm grateful to God that there is only one gospel for all. This has made it possible um, for all nations, races, or people to access the kingdom of God without yes. restrictions and regulations of religion. Yes, as imagine we were telling every nation now, say, since the gospel first came to us, that they must, their national this must be Aki and selfish. Imagine that. You know that for the Asians, they, 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 they fear us because we eat Aki, because they say they use Aki to poison people, and we have it as national dish. So they say we must be very deadly for eating it as a national dish when it is poison. But it's the way we treat it, make we can do it, because we know if we don't treat it properly, it's poisonous, but true. So, so we know that that is one of the deadliest poisoning, and we know say, it's dangerous. It's not handled properly. So, right, but at the same time, it's how we handle it, right? So, but if we made a religion out of that, no one start to impose it on the other nations. What happened to the other nations that they eat rat and lizard and, and roach and big fly and bug and slug yeah, and snake? That is their delicacies. So the CMO, you would say, ah, well, I can't stop. It's nice. The person would be uh, when they're hearing about that. You understand? And just the same way you're hearing about them with the, with the, the, the big bug and the slug and the rat and cat and dog. And turn it with a dog on the road test. And glaze him. Yeah. And, and a big spring chicken. You think, see, I mean, chicken, you look at some big frog with a foot cock out. So, yeah. so, so we, when you go and then start to scorn people for these things, the Lord is saying, that's not the gospel. You are being a hypocrite to the gospel because it says, those things don't make you cleaner than them. What goes into your mouth, you say, that don't go into your heart. It goes into the stomach and cleanse and go as drought. So it says, it's what come out of your heart. And so that's why Jesus teaching in the gospel of the kingdom. It's international. It doesn't have to, it, we don't have to change the culture. It in a place of what people eat and what kind of clothes they wear to, to become Christian. Because even into a country, in Nepal, they just have a piece of cloth wrapped around them and women going around topless. Persons still can be children of God there. That the, their code of dressing might not be considered modest to us. When you go to some place and some string wrap around them and, and they jump in around and have painting and all kind of things on their skin. You understand? It would seem more like a carnival thing to it, but that was their natural code of dressing there. And they would need to lose that code of dressing to have Christ's spirit and his word dwelling in them. You get it? But when we start to impose this regulation of what your eat uh, or your hair look at or your skin look at, then he said, was Jesus really teaching that? So Christianity have taken on teaching that though. And everybody who know about Christianity know that Christianity teach a lot about those things and disqualify a lot of people who God has qualified and 
and qualified a lot of people who God has disqualified because they are still judging by external appearance and if it sets them off a little bit or it look they say it's not God and, and the Lord is telling him I don't judge by the outward appearance I judge by the heart and if you walk according to the spirit you will judge like me according to the heart because the Lord said the spirit will show you deep things in the spirit and will show you those who are of God and those who are not huh? praise God hallelujah anyone else question comments you want to lose your time right. good night apostle uh, hello everyone um what stood out to me throughout everything that you were saying was the scripture in which Paul had rebuked Peter because like it was when you explained it then it connected to me what that scripture actually meant because at first I didn't completely understand but then I realized um, another scripture kind of like back to top is like um, if you see a beam in a brother's eye um, see to take out yours first before you see to do it to another and it was something of that Peter was displaying where at first he was all jolly with the very persons he was claiming to not be good and then when time someone else come now he's be, um, behaving another way and you spoke about this basically saying that don't just display righteousness when you come to church mm -hmm. And when you went behind your back, you're doing something else completely different and contrary to what That's you're it. being taught. Because yeah. you're not completely showcasing who Christ. is exactly Christ within you. Yeah. So that's what I got in it. And, cause, and to even lead up to something else, like for example, because when Christ comes within you, know, he basically teaches you how to behave oral. So at my workplace, even today, this helped with today, right? I was at my workplace. Compared to how other, the other workers behave, they're very loud, they're very vulgar, and they dress anyhow they want to. And I remember I was like walking, going into the storage room. This man out of nowhere, he was like, he called out to me, Christian girl. And I was like, I was a bit take, I was a, um, surprised at first because I didn't notice someone would be able to identify as quickly as that. Since you didn't go with that brand t-shirt, Chris. No. Okay, no. <laughs> no, I wasn't. <laughs> I never really expected that, yeah. to be honest. So that shows that wherever you go, you must walk in accordance, A said B, of one truth, basically, yes. in the presence, and even when time you're not in the presence mm -hmm. of the persons around you. Praise God. Right. That's Thank you. Paul said it to the believers that they must not only be obedient to the Lord in his presence, but he said, even more so in his absence. The reason he said more so is that in his presence, even if they did something wrong, he would correct them and not destroy them. But in his absence, when she doing things wrong in the presence of wolves and lions and bears, they will be devoured. The crowd will not be nice to you when you fall up before them who you are speaking against and living in a way to tell them turn from that yeah? so you need to that understand that principle that even that like like what faith said you have to keep maintain the true position in christ not just when you're around church crowd but especially around them who are not hallelujah and the several time the devil will tell you say Tone it down on me. Then she say you're one of them. <laughs> and your toning down will actually make you compromise and do things that are not fitting as saints. Amen? Yes. Go ahead, sis. Good night, everyone. Yes, good night, sister. Mary. So, Apostle, yes. I thank you for the word and thank God for sending me here. Yes, ma'am. I remember um, back when I in Spanish town and I baptized, I didn't have no work on them something there. And it go back, back to shows what you said in Ephesians that he, he gave us apostles and so. Yes. 
I didn't have no work that time and it's like me have to depend for myself. Mm -hmm. So that made me go back in the world. Yes, yes. So now I'm here and I'm not working. You provide work for me. Mm -hmm. That is an apostle. Mm, what do I call it now? Grace. Grace, sir. Yes. <laughs> oh, it should be. Because it stopped me from go back in the world. I tell myself right now, say, look here, if me go back in the world, man. No, man. <laughs> what do you mean if you attack to flesh and I say flesh? Mm -mm. Mm -hmm. No way, no way. Worst, yes. <laughs> and sometimes when I see, I uh, just say, example of some people. Mm -hmm. I have to say, mm -mm. it cannot happen. God hold me. Please. Yes. Praise God. Hold me. So uh, I thank God for here and I thank God for the word. And another thing, a question at, in, in, in 1 Timothy 1, what you read about? 1 verse 8 to 11. Yeah. Purpose okay. of the law. Um, what you say, um, when, when Paul did blaspheme, to, you normally teach us that when okay. you blaspheme, you don't have any forgiveness. Okay. So, how oh, is that? Okay, you yes. blaspheme the Holy Spirit. Oh. You see, Jesus made a statement, persons can lie against the Son and be forgiven, lie against the Father and be forgiven. But against the Holy Spirit. He, he wasn't lying against the Holy Spirit because what Paul said in that time he was an unbeliever. That time he was a what? Unbeliever. But when a believer lies against the Holy Spirit, that go deep, you know. That go deep. Because Paul said he then persecuted the saints in ignorance. In the time of his unbelief. But, but when a person like, 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 like Ananias and Sapphira. They, they were believers. And they in turn now was lying to the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit was doing a move in the church. That people were selling lands and houses. And bringing it as the whole income that was made from it. They, didn't, they wasn't tithing from it. They bring the whole money sell for the house. You will money sell for the land and put it at the apostles' feet for distribution for saints and the saints in need within the house. Huh? So there was no lack amongst them. So this was a spirit move, a Holy Spirit move by the Lord in the midst of the church. And they jump up, say, Holy Spirit, say, must do it too. Jump on the bandwagon and say, they're going to do it too. And then when they're selling the land, they realized that the price of the land was far more than what they originally thought. The land wasn't so worthless as they thought it was. The land had a great value. So the great money that come from it, they believed they could come down to the church, tell Peter, say, it's only so and so, and Peter would know, wouldn't have a clue that it was shot and they take a part of it of their own business. So that was what they suffered death for. They were cut off from the church, cut off from salvation. They died immediately. Their death was uncommon all because of money. And some people will say, no, God, no, I no money. Money not really matter. It matter. And then I said, so far, I lost their soul about it. And they were in the church. Lost their soul for it. Because they came and said, this is it. And Peter said, is that it? And they said, yes. Now it's the Lord tell Peter it wasn't it, you know. And they're lying to Peter, said, that is it. So they were lying to the Holy Spirit. And that's what Peter said. You didn't lie just to man. Huh? Come on now. Peter said, and then I said, why has Satan fill your heart to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself. 
While it remained, was it not your own? And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men. But he said, you lied to God. And I'm sure they thought they wasn't lying to God. They thought it's just Peter they're talking to. But they lost their soul for it. Fell down and dead. Judgment was immediately there. Come on. Fell down, breathed his last, and they carried him to bury him. And his wife come and agreed to the same thing. Don't even realize her husband dead and buried already. And come there, timely after, an appointed time after she come in the same day. Like three hours later. And come down not knowing what happened. Having the same plan and report to give to Peter. And Peter asks her for her to escape from the plan, you know. Because God will always give you a chance to escape from a temptation. There's always a way out of a temptation. Not true. So at that point, Peter said, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. She could have said, no. We weren't really planning to tell us about this is the truth. And escape it. But she stuck with loyalty to the husband in the lie. Watch it, you know. She stuck with loyalty to the husband in a lie. And said, yes, for so much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Come on. You remember what the Lord said when the devil wanted to carry him on a pinnacle and tell him, say, if the son of God jump up because the angels are declared in the word to provide protection for you. The Lord said, don't put the Lord to the test. That's what they actually did. They put the Lord to the test. Because they know they're wrong and they're asking, we're wrong? (laughs) Why are you going to the Lord to ask if you're wrong when you know you're wrong? Come on. He says, how is it that you have agreed together to test the spirit of the Lord? Look. The feet of those who have buried your husband are at the door and they will tear you out. And what happened to her? Immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. She wasn't sick, she wasn't feeling bad. She just breathed her last and dead. The thing that was common. The young men came in and found her dead. Carried her out, buried her by her husband. Come on. So great fear came upon what? All the church and upon all who heard these things. It's one thing to be an outsider. They speak against the church and speak against pastor and speak against prophet and speak against what the Holy Spirit doing in people. It's another thing to come in the church and do it. You You understand that? That's, That's why... At one point, Peter denied knowing Christ. So denying Christ, he was then saying, I don't know the man, so I can't say good or bad about him. Because he don't know him. So he was lying to say he don't know him. But he wasn't lying against the Holy Spirit. Judas lied against the Holy Spirit. Because Judas knew that the people is saying that Jesus is a counterfeit. He's a trickster. He's lying to the people and deceiving the people. And he, as a man who is serving as an apostle amongst Jesus' apostles, handing over Jesus to the man saying, he can't give him to him. So he didn't just go there to just bring them to him. He's handing over Jesus as a counterfeit. He's calling Jesus' whole work that was done by the Holy Spirit, the work of the devil. You remember that? That was what they were saying about Jesus in Matthew 12. Was it Matthew 12 or John 12? Matthew 12. Yeah. And Jesus said to them, this sin would not be forgiven them. 
And they are the very ones Judas was handing them over to and taking money to hand them over to him. They were calling the work of Jesus, the work of Beelzebub, the work of a chief demon. And the ministry of Jesus is the ministry of the Holy Spirit. Also, when Judas did that, he couldn't see a man. His soul was condemned. And Jesus always said it to him, Woe to the one who betrayed the Son of Man. Huh? Yeah, man, so person now, they can say all man of evil against a person figure. But when they come in here and say they get to know me, and say, me know him, so me can tell you, say, I saw you still. <laughs> you think they'll be forgiven? You better understand this thing. The, the Lord gonna cut them off just like he did with uh, what, what was that Abi Rahman and, and the other one that opposed Moses Nathan and Abi Ram yeah. opposed Moses and say I'm the other prophets here who has made this Moses Lord of us <laughs> So they said they want to choose a new leader and make the leader lead them because Moses is not lead them right. Moses looked like he get in seen aisle and mix up and they do a guesswork. So uh, Moses said to them, say, who is on the Lord's side? Stand with me. And if you see if me, if I'm really of the Lord, then 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 you're going to suffer an unusual death. But you see, if I am not of the Lord, you're going to live on to tell the tale and say everything all right. Eh. And what happened to them? The earth below them swallowed them up like quicksand. Them and the tent and the children and the stock and become solid back on the ground like so they were never there. They suffered an unusual death. What do you say? Oh, nothing don't know about them something there. They tam Ariba man who Korah. I saw. Yes, man. Numbers 26, verse 9. The sons of Eliab were new, new Nemuel, Dathan, and Abiram. These are Dathan, Dathan and Abiram, representatives of the congregation who contended against Moses and Aaron in the company of Korah. And when they contended against the Lord, and the earth opened its mouth and swallowed them up together with Korah. When the company died, then the fire devoured 250 men. And they became a sign. Come on now. Now they say, no man, God changed now. No, what this God God cool, you know, God not so hard like them time. Eh? <laughs> so now they can lift their tongue against the man of God and do all the man of evil and sit on the farm in cool and calling him all kind of names and rolling eye and giving attitude. But they, they need to know, you know. So is this same God we're dealing with? He has not changed. In fact, he says there's worse punishment for those who do such now because he says that time they were under the covenant of, of covenant made with them with the blood of bulls and goats and rams. But now he said we under the covenant made with the precious blood of his son, Jesus Christ. So he said it's a far greater covenant now with greater promises, but also with greater punishment. Yeah. Hello. No, oh, man, they don't want to hear them something. They don't want to make them get afraid. <laughs> but the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. No, so. Yeah, man, and those who know why is, you have to make them go and make them walk the road till they find out where it leads to. Because if they don't listen to those who can make them become wise, they'll walk as fools. No, sir. And in, and in good enough time will reach them. Huh? The yeah, man, God, have the time for them appointed for what is going to face them. Huh? 
He says, anyone who has rejected Moses' law dies without mercy. And what? The testimony of two or three witnesses. Did he say the same way? No, he says, of how much worst punishment do you suppose will be thought worthy? Who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing and insulted the spirit of grace. He said, how much more worse punishment? He don't say, see him. So there's worse punishment than stoning to death and earth swallow you up and fire come down, come burn you. Yeah. See, but they don't know them something. They, they're going to wait and tell. They're going to watch and see. Amen. Because who knows, who knows hear them feel, no so? Amen. Praise God. Hallelujah. That's why we're here to get the word. And if person love the word, then they love the truth. And if they love the truth and abide and practice the truth, then they won't have to worry about what, they, what is the end result of not doing it. What if they do? It's coming. Hello. Praise God. All right, any more? Praise God. All right, bow your heads. Let's pray. Time to release you. Father, we thank you for your grace and for your anointing, your word. Hallelujah is elevating and, and just illuminating our hearts to see and to understand your ways, your plans, your order over our lives that we can submit and gain the full benefit as children of God, ears of God and join ears with Christ and truly enjoy the life you have provided for us in Christ Jesus through your word and your Holy Spirit and so I pray that that grace will increase more and more, that we will not use grace as a means just to excuse us from, from, getting, from sinning and facing the punishment, that we see grace in its proper use to empower us to live as true children of God. And so I pray that as we walk by faith, we will unlock the mysteries of the kingdom and know that you live and abide in us and so we must live according that those who see can know that truly we are children of the most high God. We give you the praise and the glory as we claim the victory in Jesus' name. Come on, give him the praise right now. Give him the praise. Come on, give him a better praise than that man. Praise God. That's it. Praise God. Give you a chance to... So as the Lord has laid upon your heart and we're going to release you, uh, we just give a final word to those who are watching online. To those who are watching online, you're watching Increase in Faith Deliverance Ministry International. We are at 3 East Street, Montego Bay, Jamaica. I'm Apostle Richard Fagan, they're giving the, the gospel of the kingdom. And we expect as person to gravitate to the word and believe and mix the word with faith. Great things will be released in your hearts and in your mind to do as the Lord has laid upon your heart and to see his power manifest in ways far beyond you could ever hope, think, or imagine. Come on. Because in Christ we have the victory. Amen. And the more we submit to him and allow his life to be demonstrated and manifest through us, the more grace and favor is released for God's presence and power to show up in our life and that is the word of the kingdom and God wants you in it to win it praise God and so we encourage you we have a book released last year it's on amazon.com it's called the gospel of the kingdom subtitled the gospel that Jesus preached and we want you to get into the word build your most holy faith in the Lord don't take it for granted that you know and you know all you should know just open your heart and your mind to the Lord and look into the word that is declared. I believe God has much more to speak to you in your heart that will give you a greater understanding and revelation of his power and presence in your life. And so we encourage you, get the copy of the book. You can order it on Amazon.com. Type in the search box, Richard V. Fagan, and, 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 and you see the book come up. You can order it anywhere around the world, or you can download it through Kindle to your device, same place online. 
Praise God. Also, we have more teaching on it. Just send a friend's request to Richard B. Fagan on Facebook. You'll be plugged into our five live stream teachings. We've been teaching on this for over 20 years. And so we have been, there's much more learning, much more to be understood in the word of God as you embrace the gospel of the kingdom. Amen. And so you can be plugged into our five live stream teachings on Facebook or you can subscribe to our YouTube channel, Apostle Richard Fagan, and see we've added more scripture to that version for you to get more, compare spiritual things with spiritual things and be more bold in your answer, in your faith, in the gospel of Christ. Amen. Praise God. Also, we have four other teaching sessions here that are not live streamed, but we script it and put in what we call our daily devotional and ebook that can be downloaded to your, your device that you can read it at your own convenience. Day-to-day -day teachings of teachings in the gospel of the kingdom for January, February, March, April, May, June, and July, and even August is already out. So if you just request it from us, by the number on the screen, and of course, we'll send it to you. Want to know more about the ministry? Check out our website. It's increasingfaithintl.org. That's increasingfaithintl.org. Those who desire uh, to sow to the ministry and sow to the website, we know that many have been reporting good report in hearing the word and in really inclined their ear to what God is saying to them. To the word of God and really allowing the Holy Spirit to magnify and let that word marinate in your spirit to birth true life of Christ in them. And I believe it is happening already and more will progress. Hallelujah. To declare the truth as they walk in the truth and embrace the spirit of truth. God will unveil it more and more in their lives. Amen. Praise God. So any further question you have for us, you can Call me Richard Fagan at 876-839-9390 or 876-557-2427. Looking forward to hear from you and to build your most holy faith in the Lord. Until next time, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Come on, give God the praise. Hallelujah. Praise God. We'll bless you all for coming and for those who've taken the time to Join us online. Thank you for doing so. Hope you really take the hard word to heart and not just be a hearer of the word, but a doer of the word because it's a doer of the word that is truly blessed. Praise God. Well, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. God bless you. Really good. Have a great night in the Lord. Bless you all. Praise God.